I want to tell you something. I want you to pay very close attention while I'm preaching this morning. Because if you don't listen close, you're going to listen wrong. You're going to walk out and say, Pastor said this. And uh, I, I, I've had that happen before. Say, well, Pastor said this. When the pastor didn't say that, you thought he said that. And if you misunderstand, because the microphone sometimes cuts out when I'm talking. So uh, if you misunderstand and you have a follow-up question, give me a call. Amen. If I don't answer, please leave a message. Because I know that what you need to talk about, and I can be, I'll call you back. If I think you're a salesman, I may not call you back. I've got all the auto insurance I need. I've got all the Medicare representatives I need. And you get a certain age, and the Medicare starts calling you every other day. They want to interest you in another product. I'm not sure they want to interest me in anything. I think they want to build the Medicare system. Did I say that? Yes, I did. And if that's the most controversial thing you think I've said this morning, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> car warranty, yeah. I don't need another car warranty. I'm trying to get rid of my car. I don't need a warranty. <laughs> Austin's going to buy my Kia. He's saving up for it. <laughs> I'm going to sell it to him on payments. One easy payment. Amen. In January, every other year, the Doomsday clock is adjusted. How many knows what I'm talking about uh, when I talk about the doomsday clock? There's a, an organization that takes care of that. They Several things go into figuring all that out. Uh, but it is now set at 90 seconds. 90 seconds to midnight. By the way, that is the closest it's been to midnight in many, many, many years. <coughs> Bible tells us that in the midnight hour, Jesus is coming. Now, I'm not trying to make something out of, I'm not a, what do you call it, a conspiracist theorist. I don't try to take this verse and that verse and try to make some kind of anxious doctrine on it. I'm just telling you where we live. Now, now what does that mean? And uh, as of January 23rd, it was, this is still the closest the clock has ever been to midnight. And that reflects the continued state of unprecedented danger that the world faces. There are many things that they take into consideration. They look at the state of nuclear challenges all over the world. If you haven't seen the news this week, the Middle East is about to explode. Now I'm going to tell you something. Don't even try to figure out what I'm saying if I am promoting a particular candidate or whether I'm not. The only one I will promote around here is Terry. <laughs> Terry, raise your hand. <laughs> and uh, you know why I will promote her? She goes to our church. She ties. I know about her. Yeah. Now, when you get elected, you're not leaving, are you? Only if he takes me. Okay. <laughs> She's going to stay right here. So I'm not a very political person, and Ms. Terry can tell you that because we've had conversations. So I'm not pointing for a particular political outcome. 
but I am going to tell you there's an evilness that is trying to take over America. If you haven't seen it, you've been somewhere sleeping. You know, that old erroneous head in the sand business that just doesn't exist. They don't do that, but you can still believe it if you want to. When you see a problem, the officer sticks his head in the sand. No, they don't. They run towards the problem. They'll attack it. That's why they're my boots. <laughs> and that's why but you get some awesome boots right there, man. They make good boots. But I wonder sometimes, and I got to tell you, there's a lot of pastors that will not preach on prophecy. There's a lot of congregations that will not, don't want to hear about prophecy. I can't, I can't for the life of me figure that out. Because if you're not aware of this, about 30% of the Bible was and is prophecy. When it was written, it was prophetic. About 27% of it is still predictive. 28 in the Old Testament, nine, and 21 in the New Testament. And at the time the Bible was written, a fourth of it, 25% of it, was predictive. The return of Christ is mentioned more than 300 times in the New Testament. He's coming back. Now, when we think about that, that means that one out of every 25 verses in the New Testament deals with the return of Christ. So, do you want to know the whole counsel of God? Amen. Let me ask you that. Do you want to know the whole counsel of God? Amen. The only thing I can think of why pastors don't preach on this is they're afraid of it. They don't know that much about it. And, uh, you know, I, I don't have a definitive answer on many things in prophecy. I just will tell you some things I don't know, and time will work it out. Amen. Amen. I don't know the old saying. I don't know if it's a pre-trip, post-trip, mid-trip. I told you before, I'm pan trip It's all going to pan out someday. Amen. God's going to make it in his time. But in 2 Timothy 4 and 1, and let me just tell you, we should for sure study God's prophetic plan for the ages. If you want to know what the Bible says, you need to study prophecy. You see, we live in a period where some people, all they'll talk about is grace. We live in a prosperity gospel movement. It's been around for many years. There are pastors, all they want to talk about is money. You know why? <laughs> they want the money. Amen. There's there's a lot of pastors that that's, that's their message. We talk about our responsibility to God, but I got news for you. Your tithe doesn't go to me. It goes to the church. And the church blesses many people. Come on. Amen. 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 If you haven't been blessed by God returning something to you in the congregation, I haven't found about, out about your need. If you have a need, we'll do our best to help with it. Amen? Amen. If the church can't be in Miss Donna, do our best. Hello? Amen. Wish I had some. Is this wood? <laughs> Knock on wood. Second Timothy 4 and 1. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, he shall judge both the quick that's living and the dead that is appearing in his kingdom preach the word. Paul is telling Timothy 
I'm charging you with this. Preach the word. When God places a call on your life, you have no option but to preach the word. Well, the Sean is working towards his ministerial license. He's got to preach the word. Amen. 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 Pastor Gladys, preach the word. Linda, preach the word. They're all ministers of the gospel. Preach the word. You're challenged that, Miss Pat. Preach the word. You don't have an option. You have to preach the word. I don't have a choice just to make you feel good. I like it when I can. I'm, you know, most of you feel good when I preach. Amen. The rest of you feel good when I stop preaching. He <laughs> said, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Now we can cut this part out. Reprove. Rebuke. Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they will run to and fro, and they, will, they shall turn uh, away their ears from the truth, and shall return and shall turn into, unto fables. They'll get out of the book. There's over 260 translations of this book. Some of them are good. Most of them are good. Some of them are not worth the onion leaf paper that they put them on. Hello? The New Testament Bible that is, what's the name of it? There's a New Testament, I'll just say it, there's a New Testament Bible made for queers. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I would not recommend that Bible to you. I'm not making a judgment on you. And I'll, listen to me. I, nothing I say this morning is a judgment on you. But I am called to preach the gospel. I'm called to reprove. I'm called to rebuke. I'm, to, I'm called to exhort with all long suffering. That's what I'm supposed to do. I exhort, lift you up and all, with all long suffering. Every word that I say, I got to do it this way. And because the time is coming, and I believe the time is here, when they will not endure sound doctrine, they will walk away from the traditional teaching of the church. Well, preacher, I don't like tradition. I, I, you know what? This has been tried and true. Yes. Every word in this book Amen. has been tried and true, has been proven. Amen. When you compare the end times Bible prophecy to what has happened in, in the earth's history, and what's happening around the world today, we can have no doubt that we're living in the last days. Amen. Now I want to take a look at what kind of people, <laughs> how many are a people here this morning? Amen. Most of you are a people. <laughs> the rest of you be here Wednesday night. <laughs> Because he's going to talk about some people that were in a graveyard, dead in a doornail. And God raised them up. God asked Ezekiel, can these bones live again? He said, Lord, you only, only you know that. There's some things that only God knows. He knows that in the last days, people are going to turn away from the true teaching of God, the true teaching of the church. They're going to find a gospel that makes them feel good, a gospel that doesn't 
reprove them, that doesn't rebuke them, a gospel that doesn't take, exhort them in a, in a way to change their life. I got I got to tell you something. Yes, Jesus hung out with prostitutes and thieves and things like that. And uh, but I'm going to tell you something. He didn't leave them that way. He transformed their lives. And you see, when God comes into your life, He'll change you. He'll make you new. He'll, he'll make you a new person. Amen. Now I want to tell you what kind of people that are going to be living in these last days. And this is the title of my message this morning. Found in 2 Timothy 3. Brother, do you have the Living Bible translation in there? No, just the living. No. I'm going to read from the Living Bible. Well, get up the NLT. That might be close. 2 Timothy 3. It says, you should know this. The Living Bible reads like this. You may as well know this too. I want to preach for a few moments. You may as well know this. It's happening all over the world. You may as well know it. You close your eyes to it, but you may as well know it. In the last days, he's talking to Timothy. You may as well know this too, Timothy, that in the last days, it's going to be very difficult to be a Christian. For people will live only I will love only themselves and their money. They will be proud and boastful, sneering at God, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful to them, and thoroughly bad. They will be hard-headed and never give, to, uh, give in to others. They will be constant liars, troublemakers. They will think nothing of immorality. They will be rough and cruel and sneer at those who try to do good. They will betray their friends. They will be hot-headed, puffed up with pride, prefer good times to worshiping God. They will go to the church, yes, but they won't really believe anything they hear. Don't be taken in by people like that. You may as well know it. Sounds like today. You may as well know it. It's happening everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. These verses give us a clear indication about what the people living in the last days will be like. And I want to quickly go through just some of the traits that I read to you a while ago and uh, see if they match any of the people we, in the world today. First of all, it says they're going to be lovers of themselves. Lovers of themselves. That means the people will put themselves before anyone else. It's all about me. Who is that that sang a country song? I want to talk about me. Austin, what's that song? You don't know that. Who? Toby Keith, if I'd have thought about it, I'd have put that up there. You would have? Yes, I would have. I want to talk about me. This is what some people are. I want to talk about me. You know I have my phone here. Every time I tap it, I see Donna's face. And she's smiling. And I say, all right. Some people, all they want to do is talk. You ever met anybody like that? All they want to talk about is themselves. Amen. You ever you ever notice that? They're going to be, I'm going to talk to you. These are people that's going to be in the church. Let me go one step further. These are the people that are in our church. Oops. I want to talk about me. I want to tell you how good looking I am today. I asked Michael this morning, how's my hair look? First of all, I asked him out at the group sound. He did a thumbs up. Then I asked him, how's my hair look? <laughs> he did a thumbs up. How's Pat's hair look? Pat <laughs> <laughs> only got two thumbs up. 
I'm up to here, I'm a beautician, so I'm going to go back to the other purple. Beautiful. Amen. But some people, that's all they can talk about. Now, if you only get in my face, I'm going to talk about my grandkids. I'm going to talk about my other grandkids. I'm going to talk about Miss Becca. I've adopted her. Miss Jelly. I've adopted her. Kit, I've adopted you, Kit. <laughs> I've adopted all, I, I made him a great deal of my Kia because he's my adopted grandson. You don't want to be my grandpa? You want me to be your grandpa? Oh, you don't want the grandpa man. You can put some dice in it and it would be nice. <laughs> this generation. Instead of loving God first, the Bible asked, the, the question was asked of Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? What's the greatest commandment? They were trying to trick him. What's the greatest commandment? He said that, that you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, everything, every morsel about you. Love God first. And the second one is just like it. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. He said, on these two prophets, right. on these two scriptures, hang all or hinge all the prophets. It opens the door. Those are the two scriptures that opens the door. We tried to hang a door without good hinges. You know? They, they don't stay up there long. Those are the two hinges that hang all of God's prophecies, all his promises, everything that we have in God. Love God and love your neighbor. How many love your neighbor? Do you love your neighbor greater than you love yourself? That's not what's happening in the world. People are putting themselves first in everything in this world. And I believe there's a lot of good people in the world. But the majority think more of themselves than God and others. They think about more about themselves. I don't feel I don't feel like going to church today. I'm not going to church today. I got up this morning and my hair would not cooperate. So I'm not going to church. You know what will happen if that keeps up? Your hair will fall out. <laughs> just, just ask Randy. They'll tell you it'll fall out. His fell all the way down to the bottom shelf down there. The motto of today is look after number one. Don't worry about other people. Just look after yourself. What does that person need in life? And 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 we get sometimes overwhelmed with things. I drive around the corner of our street down here and I see 20 people around the back of a pickup truck and the worst thing in my mind is, can I be honest? The first thing in my mind is, uh-oh, we might have a problem. Because it was from that street corner that the gentleman came down and threw a brick through our window of our van, broke the handle on the door, and still couldn't get in. God said, nope. But you look around, you see people on the street corner. What do you think? What's their need? Do they need something? More times than one, Donna and I both 
were both equally equally guilty of this. We'll see somebody say, let's help them. I can't give them all I got, but I can give them a couple of bucks. And, you know, there's occasion we'll be out in the restaurant. We'll see somebody having dinner. We'll see them very meticulously going through the menu. We'll tell the waitress, don't tell them, but give us their bill. Is that scoring me points? I don't think so. Not with God. But everywhere you can do something to think about others, do it. Be caught helping someone. Be caught helping a homeless person. I can't help them, Pastor. Goodness gracious. You see what they're wearing? I can't stop and talk to them. I, people might associate me with them. They might think something's wrong with me. All right. Everybody's tired of hearing about that part. Uh, me too. I'm moving on. Another person you're going to have living among us is those people that are covetous. He says, that they're going to be those kind of people. And we're living in a covetous this world today. Somebody will figure out how to say that and tell me later. No. Uh, you guys don't know either, okay. But that we're living in a world that's full of... Covet. I'll say that, coveting. Greed. Greed, that'll work. And I believe there's never been a time like this where the whole world covets one thing or another. They, they've got to have that. They will work their fingers to the bone to have that. They will work themselves sick to have that. Whatever that is. That might be a new car. That might be a different home. That might be a $500, but that ain't, that's normal. And it might be a $1,000 suit. That used to be obnoxious. Now that's pretty normal. <laughs> Bag of groceries is $500. <laughs> but whether it's cars, money, clothes, whether they covet a woman like David did, we live in a society of greed. All they want is more. We have people in the church that's like that. Jesus met a young man that was that way. He was going to tear down his barns because he filled up all his barns. They were full to the brim. He was going to tear the barns down a big, bigger build bigger barns so you can put more in it. Let me tell you something. The stuff you put in your barn down here is stuff that you're going to have for the time you're down here. You're going to lose it after that. The stuff that you put in the bank in heaven, the Lord said, lay yourself up not gold on earth where thieves moth rust. All those things destroy it. Amen. He said, but lay treasures up in heaven. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I, I, I'm so glad to know that God keeps a good record. Amen. You see, I don't have a lot down here. But I'm going to tell you something. I, I believe we got a bank full in heaven. Amen. 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 And there is no ATM machines up there. <laughs> Amen. I'll stop on that part. Thank you. We should be seeking after heavenly riches, not earthly riches. The man that was going to build a barn, Jesus said, you're a fool. You're a fool because tonight, 
His soul is going to be required of you. What are you going to do with it then? It was a story, and I'm moving on just as fast. Never mind. Um, story of a gentleman that put money into the house of God. He was a good tither. And others knew that. I don't know how they knew that. We purposely keep our giving records totally private. But the story does get out of a generous giver. Those that are generous with the Lord. And he gave, and he gave, and he gave. And one day, he lost every dime that he had. And people came around to mock him. Say, oh, don't you wish you had all that money you put in the church? Wouldn't you be rich today? Think about what you would have today. He said, I want to tell you something. The only thing that I have left is the things that I put in heaven. Amen. This is not a sermon about money. But he did talk about a greedy people that wants to withhold from God and the things of God. You can keep it. Amen? Have you ever been to a funeral? How many has never been to a funeral? I've been to uh, hundreds of funerals. I've, I've done hundreds, literally hundreds of funerals. And you know what I have never seen at any funeral? I've never seen a U-Haul behind the hearse. <laughs> when, when they're gone, it's gone. Amen. I'm going to leave it all for my kids. And, that, and that's a good thought. You can do that. I'm not talking about that part. I'm talking about those that are greedy. And they put everything before God. Everything. Remember what? Third thing I noticed in this verse is in the church today, you've got those that are boasters, proud. Pride is if you're not familiar with it, pride is what made Satan fall from heaven. Did you know that? The Bible tells us that pride goeth before a fall. One of the reasons that people seek after these material goods and wealth is because of pride. I want people to know what I've got. Man, I want people to know I drive a Cadillac. Anybody in here drive a Cadillac besides Jim? You ever ridden in Jim's Cadillac? Who is Jim? Not Jim Ron. Thank you for correcting me. Jim don't have a Cadillac back right there, do you? Ron's got a Cadillac. Donald's got a Cadillac, it's called a Kia Cadillac. <laughs> There's a lot of people, that's, that's what they want. Man, I want people to know. I had a preacher one time. Good friend of mine. And I loved him with all my heart. But he said, Ronnie said, you know, in order to, and he was an evangelist, he said, in order to make it in this world, evangelistic world, you have to dress the part. You have to dress for success. And you know what, I've seen it, I've seen people that dress for success. I figured if I'm successful, I'm dressed. <laughs> That's, you know, you know, I get, I get the last part of me on it, so I'm done. Forget it. Does it match? I hope so. <laughs> Amen. But doesn't God doesn't care what you wear? Well, that got me in trouble. God doesn't care what you wear. That's true. You can wear beautiful cowboy boots. 
That's more holy than most. <laughs> you know, we God doesn't care. Sister Clyde, she doesn't care. We don't care. He wants you to present yourself the best you can. Whatever you're wearing, that's the best you've got. Wonderful. If you need some help, we'll help you with it. But not everybody has to wear a suit. Now that same evangelistic pastor who was wearing a three-piece suit and shiny patent leather shoes changed their thought and now wears blue jeans and a shirt untucked and tennis shoes to preach in. And that's all right. Whatever floats your boat. But why are you doing it? Is it because they say, look at me, look at me, look at me. I want you to see me. Is what you're wearing bringing glory to you or glory to God? Why are you wearing what you're wearing? That's not part of it. My sermon today it just snuck in there. Fourth thing, real quickly. This is one that I don't even need to cover, but I'm going to cover it. There are those that are going to be disobedient to parents. Disobedient to parents. How many have raised kids? How many have ever been a kid? Almost everybody. Some of you don't want to commit because you don't know what I'm going to say. And you're the ones I'm going to say it to. We live in a society where children are probably the most disrespectful I've ever seen in my life. That's true. That's true. That's true. The most disrespectful. I was watching a, sometimes I watch different things on YouTube because I don't like paying for other TV, so I watch YouTube, it's free for the commercials. So I'm watching this program and uh, this guy had uh, had these people meet him at his yard where his shop was. And they were, these whole family was standing out in front of the shop. It must have been a half a dozen of them. A dad, a mother, kids all the way down to four years old. And they were standing in front of this gentleman's camera, giving him the California peace sign <laughs> and screaming at the top of the lungs a horrible, horrible statement. He goes along with that one fingered peace sign. How could a kid four or five years old do that? You know how they can do it? Because mom and dad were doing it. They learned it at home. My kids never saw that. My kids never spoke that. Did you discipline your kids? Oh, ask them. You don't think that they'd ask them. But they turned out, they didn't turn out for any of the worse for them. But disobedient to parents. Respect is something that's really lacking in these last days especially from children. I, I never thought I'd see it. I, I did not think that I would see this when, when we were, we didn't have any kids. And we were in a restaurant and there was this family sitting there and the kid was about four years old, screaming at his parents, 
jumping on the table, throwing things at his parents, and screaming. Carla, we don't want any kids. <laughs> Not other like that. And I thought, what is this world coming to? And that was what? 40 years ago. I mean, we got kids are how old? 42 now? That was before we had kids. And it's only gotten worse to see these kids, some of them. And some of them are the most respectful that I know. Some of the kids in here are the most respectful that I know. Some have a hard time with it. But most of them are okay. I'm not naming anybody. What are you laughing at over here on this side? <laughs> Respect your parents. Those of you that are involved with kids in school, Linda, you know how they can be. You know how they can treat you in school. It's amazing. Something else that we live in in our society is very unthankful of people. It says ungrateful. They consider nothing sacred. And we live in a day and age like that. People are unthankful. When's the last time you just stopped and gave thanks to God when you woke up in the morning? When's the last time you said, thank you, God, for the good health? Well, Pastor, you're not in good health. I'm thanking him for it anyway. I'm going to be. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us healthy, Don and I. Thank you for bringing Thank you I got up and I was able to breathe this morning. Thank you, Lord, for this great meal. It's the last time you've done that. When you went for a walk on the, out in the country, so I, I haven't done that in a long time, and I missed that. But I can't look around. We take a drive. We can't look around and say, thank you, God, for this beautiful creation. If you have never driven up around Lake Tahoe, Lake, Lake Tahoe, thank you, and Donner Lake, it's a beautiful lake. But if you've never driven up there, to go it to yourself. Beautiful area. Stop at KFC and grab you a bucket and head through there. <laughs> you don't even have to cook. And thank God for the KFC, too. Amen. We are living in an unthankful, ungrateful world. Uh, it, are you guilty of that? We live in an unholy world. We're going to see that, he tells us. Nothing is sacred anymore. Just look at the Olympics. I was sickened by what I saw of the display of the most holy event in scriptures. There are people in our churches all over the country that are unholy. Nothing sacred to them. The altars are not sacred. I want to tell you something. I don't consider these something that possesses any power. But I think this is a sacred bench. Amen. Amen. Where you come and you kneel down and you meet with God. And the presence of God needs to be there. Can you meet with you someplace else? Absolutely. I've got a stump in the back of my property in California where I had spent hours agonizing with God going through something. That was where I met with him. This is the place where you meet with God. Is that, is that holy? Well, we've, we've consecrated it. 
we've dedicated it to the service of God. So yeah, I kind of consider the holy place is where you meet with God. We should be striving to make those things of God sacred. We live in a culture that's been in there. Turn it down. Turn it down.